In the last episode of Plant One On Me, we met up with Justin Schroeder, the program manager of the Amazon Spheres, to get a little background on the making of the glass houses. But in this episode, we'll do a deep dive of some of the most interesting plants on the first floor of the spheres. All right, we're going to try to tackle as much of the first floor as possible. Yeah, there's a lot to see, so we'll try to get as much in. And that one right there is, I've seen it around, but not necessarily in the U.S. That uh, yeah, that's Anthurium luxurians. Uh, we have a couple of them in here. Um, they're very, very slow growing, but... Are they really? Yeah, they have amazing foliage. I mean, that plant the probably puts on like one leaf a year. You know, <laughs> even in this condition? Even in this condition, oh, yeah. I love the coriaceous you know, oh, structure yeah, of it. Oh, yeah, that dark and color. It's, it's one of my favorites. it's flowering right now. Yeah, it is. It's doing great. And you have a lot of kind of the Calathea slash Jupertia in the understories here. Yes, I mean, they're really, really great understory plants. Uh, they do really well in this environment. Uh, plus, they're, like, the diversity is just amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that people comment on is that it looks like they've been hand painted, mm. which I completely agree with. Yeah. I mean, it's just they're one of the most diverse and toughest plants we have in the space. I especially like the Tenanthes. I think yeah. they're they're probably some of the tougher ones. Yeah, definitely. Maiden hair, people always talk about how challenging they are indoors. Yeah. But so this is we have some really unique species in here too. Uh, two of the larger frond forms. We have Adiantum macrophyllum mm -hmm. and we also have Adiantum pruvianum, which we'll see through as well. You know, the new fronds coming out in that kind of hot pink color. Yeah. Uh, just the size comparison to the ones that we typically see, it's like people don't even realize it's a fern. You know, it's, it's, it's a great plant to tie people back to something that they've seen, but maybe not this type before. And this is macrophyllum then? Yes, adding okay. to macrophyllum. Is this um, a begonia? Erythrophyllum? Is this, a, this is a large begonia, one? I believe, acetosa. Oh, acetosa, yeah, yes. yes. Oh my god, your leaves are so much larger <laughs> than mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. They, uh, they do really, again, really well in this in these conditions. I think one of the things that we we can do in here that you can't do in a house, yeah. that I can't do in my house, is the nighttime drop and then the humidity. You know, it's that the humidity is, is really great, and if you can get that kind of 20 degree drop, that's kind of the sweet spot mm -hmm. where you have a difference between day and night it really the plants really respond in a, in a much more natural way and you get like you know more flowering and more uh, typical growth habit yeah so this is the um, Ruelia macleana it's uh, it really is a tough plant it does well here there's a lot of foot traffic that comes through here Some, you know we have an average about a thousand people a day that pass through here so mm. It's really, it's really been tough spilling over the edge like that, surprisingly so. And the Fetonia, of course, is probably also equally as tough. It's very tough and it's very common. You know, we don't shy away from common plants. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a great, again, to show people to tie them into like something they've seen either at a local nursery or they have in their own home. To see that how it kind of grows naturally is, is a great way to tie them into, into the space. You don't always see kind of creeping begonias, but this one is something that I see also on the house plant market, and you have it here, just like on the ross, mossy rock, which is which is wonderful. Yeah, this is this is how you kind of see it grow in nature. It, it likes to kind of cascade and grow over over like rock edges and stuff. So this is a great great way to kind of show people how you typically see it growing in the wild. Yeah. It's a fantastic plant. Begonia thelma, that's right. Thel yes, thelma. Thelma, yeah. Some more of your ruelia actually in bloom, which I think yeah. are nice to see in bloom. I mean, you have a lot, if I'm just looking around, in bloom right now. Yeah, you know, we, we tried to like, when we designed this, we looked for stuff that would be blooming at different times of the year. So anytime you come through, you might see something new. <laughs> Yeah, These this is an unidentified uh, Aristolochia, Aristolochia species that we got. If anybody knows the name on it, it'd be great to, yeah, <laughs> great hey, to find out. Yeah, hey, you know out. what? We have a lot of great botanists <laughs> yeah. who watch the channel, so if you guys know what Aristolochia that is, that would be, yeah. would be great to holler. Pipers, which I think are just yeah, so beautiful. The piper crocatums, yeah. uh, lots of different piper species in here. Um, they're, you know, great, Brilliant. useful plants in the landscape. So this one's kind of creeping. Does it... Yeah, Does it will kind of spread around. Yeah. It will. It can actually climb things as well, but yeah. we're kind of using it as a as kind of a scrambler, a ground cover scrambler through here. And what kind of begonia is this? This is begonia. I believe it. The cultivar name for this one is Silver Blister, hmm. but I think it's a cultivar of Imperialis. Oh. We got our our Depia here, which is a great plant that's 
Got a good story behind it. It's extinct in the wild now. It was Is it really? Discovered in Mexico in this the late right 90s. Here. Yeah, it's uh, they call it the golden fuchsia. It's related to coffee. When it flowers, it gets these pendulous bright yellow flowers, and it's a uh, it's a great plant, a great story too. It's a uh, it's grown wild, widely in cultivation now. So it's one of those kind of stories where, you know, you can actually do some conservation through cultivation. Right. Yeah. Is there, um, is it usually propagated by seed or are the people just taking well, grafting? Well, it's been or? mostly cuttings. I think okay. there has been some seed produced now. I think early on they, they weren't able to get pollination on the mm -hmm. flowers. So a lot of it was just cuttings and rooted cuttings. But I think, I, I think I've heard that there has been some success in, in producing seed now, so. Bertolonia? Yeah, that's Bertolonia. It's uh, a great little mellowstone. The color is amazing on that plant. It doesn't get too tall. Gorgeous. I love the, the reddish purple yeah. hue. And then those pink flowers on top really make it pop. This one's fun. Yeah, this is Corito plectus. It's a great, great plant. I was lucky enough to see this in the wild once. Oh, uh, yeah? And it looks just like that. It was yeah. like just by itself. <laughs> in the middle of the jungle, just sitting there growing. It's just an amazing plant to see. Some pileas. Yeah, that's pilea grandiflora. It's just about to bloom. Yeah, and actually this is, we got this from Fairchild. Hmm. Um, it was just a little cutting that I got from out from their landscape. And we actually have a lot of it on our living wall too. It's been a great, really tough plant. It actually gets kind of woody and bushy over time, yeah, which that's, is neat. Yeah, it's, it's shocking to me because I always think of um, Pilea as a little bit more as like kind of understory, kind of close to the ground, like a Fetonia. Yeah, yeah. But these are bushes. Yeah, they, and they Shrubby. will get even taller, actually. Uh, the ones at Fairchild were about double that height. Wow. So it's, and they get really woody, which is kind of unique as far as Pileas go. I have to point out this varicosum. Yeah, this is a, one of our favorites here. I mean, the, those fuzzy petioles and just the backside that's got kind of the pink coloration and then the beautiful modeling on the surface and the kind of velvety iridescence. I mean, what's not to love? I know, I mean, I've, I was in Costa Rica and um, it's interesting, you have yours kind of climbing up. I've, I saw a lot like kind of trailing through the yeah, woods. But yeah, They're probably looking for that yeah, tree to Yeah, they're looking for that on. tree to climb, but yeah, it's uh, it, um, when you give them something to go up, they, they definitely uh, take advantage of that. Clusia is not something that I've really seen in the houseplant market as much, but when I think of it, I think of very similar to a ficus lyrata. Yeah. It's like one of those ones that could be a nice tree for the home. I think so, actually. And I think, you know, the only limiting factor might be light. They do like a fair amount of light, but they're very tough. They can take uh, low humidity. Actually, in high humidity, they get a lot of aerial roots that grow out of them, but hmm. they will grow well in pretty low humidity. And I think you're right. I think um, there's a lot of great Clusiest species out there that uh, might be well suited for the home. Hoffmanias. Hoffmanias, yeah. So challenging to yeah, grow indoors unless are, it's under a glass jar. They're challenging, <laughs> and I'll tell you, they're challenging in here too. You know, um, we have a lot of little microclimates in here, so just finding the right spot. I think it was key to get enough light to it, but also not let it get too dry during the day. Um, we use some our MeFog system. It comes on as it did oh on cue. Oh my God, that's a... On cue, it came on, so. Um, You're brilliant. Yeah, yeah, uh, that wasn't planned. Um, and, you know, it creates little microclimates that we can sort of plant specifically for, you know, that environment. And we, we can adjust that. They're on timers. Um, they're not controlled by the humidity levels. The humidity level is all controlled by our HVAC system. This is just adding supplemental humidity and moisture into certain areas. So how can you tell a Peruvianum from a macrophyllum? Like uh, so, the leaf the leaf shape on the fronds is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, these are a little more triangular. Peruvianum is almost like a square, mm. um, and we'll actually see some as we go around the perimeter, and I'll okay. point those out. Uh, and then the fronds come out more of a burgundy color on the Peruvianum, whereas mac uh, macrophylla comes out kind of this pink color. This aroid right here. You yeah, know? that is, I believe that's Chlorospatha. I was thinking it was Rhodospatha, but yeah. I think it's Chlorospatha. This one's an interesting plant. Yeah, this actually uh, resembles kind of piper leaves. This is actually in the blueberry family. This is Ceratostemma. It's Ceratostemma len lenatum. Uh, it has these great little bright red and purple hanging flowers that look like little candies. 
And it's, a, and it's an epiphyte, clearly. It's an epiphyte, yeah. It's growing in that uh, trunk there. Well, while I'm down here, there's something that is just standing out to me right here. Oh, that yeah. little uh, glaucus caladium Yeah, right that's there. caladium picture autumn. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic little guy. It uh, has these great silvery leaves. Um, when they're not wet, it actually will, it like glows in the landscape. So it's, you know, we put them in these dark spots. So you have these kind of little highlight areas. Uh, it will go dormant. It's um, like a lot of caladiums, it goes dormant. So Do it's kind of a surprise when it comes up. So yeah. you don't have to remove any of the bulbs or anything No, like we, that. we leave them in here. They kind of go through natural dormancy. I think um, with, uh, you know, in the wild, it might be kind of temperature condition related, but they, they, they come back pretty well for us in here. So I see that you have a lot of these kind of like bluish kind of glowing plants around here. Yeah, lots of uh, plants with iridescence. A lot of yeah. these ferns, the elaphoglossums um, have a lot of great iridescence. This is elaphoglossum metallicum um, next to elaphoglossum uh, lance uh, lanceanum, um, which show these kind of cool oily colors to them. And then some more elaphoglossums, but not. Yeah, this is elaphoglossum uh, Citrina. And it looks like this is one that collects water. Yes, along exactly. Its fuzzy. Yeah, and then the fronds leaves. have these great little hairs all over yeah, them. Yeah, feels so cool. <laughs> and then Geogenanthus, which is actually, it's, it's really a beautiful plant. It gets a little scraggly. It can get yeah. a little leggy, yeah. yeah. Um, it does like some light. You know, it's one of the things that. Um, you know, it's interesting with these low light plants. It's mm -hmm. one of the conversations I have a lot with people. You know, it's like, why is my plant not doing good in my house? It's a low light plant, but you don't give it any light. Yeah. You know, these plants have evolved to um, to get to be able to efficiently use light. So, uh, what we don't think about inside, what we have outside, is that the sun is not in a stationary position. So the sun rises and sets. Mm -hmm. So you get times of the day where there'll be beams of light that come through its different angles. Mm -hmm. Um, and then these plants with the iridescence have even uh, evolved to, um, the iridescence actually helps them collect more light when it's available. So. Right, the iridoplasts, which yep, are these modified exactly. chloroplasts. Yeah, that which are fantastic. Light. I mean, they slow down light, they use quantum mechanics. It's like, mm -hmm. it's really cool. It's yeah, mind the mind blowing <laughs> that they've evolved to do this. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I always remind people is that, you know, just because it's a low light plant doesn't mean it's a no light plant. Yeah, and I, I just have to put, um, point this out, this is uh, the Drymonia, which I have actually, I had in my bathroom, I have it growing elsewhere, yeah. but you could see that, you know, mine's a little bit like, probably gets a little mm -hmm. bit more top down light yeah, and yeah. it's starting to get longer internodes, yep. but it's it's neat to see this because it's, yours is meatier. Yeah. It's almost getting like this woody aspect to it, yeah, which yeah. is so cool to actually see them, you know, a little bit further along in their growth. Yeah. Not a, not a cool Nadio calyx, calyx, yeah, yeah Ecuadorensis. Yeah, that's a, it's beautiful. I, I, I'm really attracted to that dark-leaved plant, and I see that you're, yeah, you we have are them too. planted down here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so here's another Dramonia. Yeah, another one. Yeah, we like to, you know, I like to add multiples of things around, so when you see one thing, there's usually a patch. I mean, you know, you typically don't see, like, one of everything in a landscape mm -hmm. in the, out in the, you know, wild, so it's like trying to repeat things and repeat textures. Begonia luxurians. Yeah, begonia luxurians. Um, you know, this is this is a great plant. Uh, it will get very tall, actually, and grows pretty fast. Um, it's one of my favorite begonias. I love the digitate. Yeah. Like leaves. Yeah. And then I, I want to point this. Out. This is a stromanthi, yeah, right? Yeah, stromanthi. Yeah. And it sometimes gets that that long stem, mm -hmm. which I've noticed after having it for for quite some time. Do you have a little bit more insight on this? Because like yes. the rest of the plant is down yeah. here. Yeah, so this is this is one of the things that this does over time as these plants mature. They send out these stalks. Um, these will actually, as they get, they will continue to grow at the top and they'll get top heavy mm -hmm. and they'll eventually just fall over. Um, and then these guys will actually root from these nodes here. So it's a way to kind of ace actually propagate itself and move around in the, in the environment. So when you see these things, um, you know, this is very um, uh, typical growth. This is kind of what they do in the wild. This is healthy, it's natural. Um, if you do want to take these things off, I this is how we propagate them. I usually cut a couple inches of here and then mm. I just stick this in some perlite mix and then keep it moist and you'll get roots out of the bottom nodes here. So that's how we've got all these in here. We're from uh, asexual propagation in that way. Really good tips on propagating these. Yeah. I just want to point out some of the um, aroids here just because if I don't, some of the, the aroid <laughs> folks will be like, wait, what was that one? Yeah, yeah. 
You have your Anthurium vici yeah, back here. Yeah, that's Anthurium vici. Again, a really, really fantastic plant. The only uh, challenge here is to display it in a way where these, you know, eventually six foot long leaves won't be leaning on the ground. So uh, you'll see some on our living wall that uh, are actually, you know, kind of how they you'd see them in the wild, growing very epiphytically and um, leaves hanging way down. Is that a jungle boogie, do you know? Or is that like a cultivated variety of, of philodendron? I believe it's a species. Okay. Um, but it is a parent of that. Okay. Um, I am blanking on the species name on no that worries. one right now. And then uh, you have some bird's nest anthuriums yeah, here, right? Yeah, yeah. Some of these are cultivated varieties. I believe this one is a cultivated variety, but we have Plaumonia in here and we have uh, Superbum. We have a few other ones in here as well. Well, sh should we, uh, oh, I guess, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Philodendron yeah, squ squamiferum. Squamiferum, uh, squamiferum type. You know, the thing with the, you know, the aeroids is there's so many that are like in groups, you know, yeah. like varicosum, there's a varicosum group where there's probably 20 or 30 plants that all are varicosum types. Yeah. So they just haven't broken it down like into all these individual, they haven't, they haven't made these all individual species yet. You know, there's squamiferum that's a little bit different, has bigger leaves, but this was, we received this as squamiferum and so we've learned otherwise, we just keep those names because yeah, you kind of I mean, have to do that. Not everybody's doing genetic studies yeah, on yeah. them overnight. Even that, you know, you can't see. I just want to, I want to put this out not to like, yeah. but like here, a little mealybug. Oh yeah. Kinda, just there, but you see how healthy the plant is. Yeah. And sorry, I'm just gonna, I'll take that one off yeah. for you. But I just, it's good to show folks that yeah, like, yeah. Sometimes. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's there's going to be some pests in here. You're going to be able to find some if you look. The idea is to have to look for them and not have plant damage. This, this is the Peruvianum. Yeah, this is Peruvianum. So you see a little bit different shape in the frond there. And again, when these roll out, and there's actually one rolling out here, it's not out very far, but they come out, and they're this really nice bronze yeah. color. Is this a cinnamon? No, that's Ooh. actually another blueberry. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, yeah, that's Samicea. I think it's Samicea sodoroi. So more pipers, lots of oh, cool wow, piper that's species. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Again, when I think of piper, I think of something a little bit more low lying. Yeah, so this yeah. Is, uh, or you know, kind of clambering. This one's a little bit more like bush. Yep, very bushy. Yeah. These are nice. They, these are uh, pure pure or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Really nice undersized. Yeah, really nice undersized. This great fuzzy stem. Beautiful pinks. They do get um, these kind of reddish pink flowers on them too, which are really pretty. Gloriosums. <laughs> Gloriosum. Wow, yeah. this is a nice one. Kind of have Gloriosum. It's a really <laughs> really tough plant. I actually grow this as a house plant at my house. It's one of the few that does really well. Um, it will handle a little lower humidity and have um, you, um, low light. Have you gotten the philodendron luxuriens yet? That uh, kind of looks a little gloriosum-like? Yeah, yeah, we have it in our um, greenhouse collection. We just haven't found a home for it in here yet. These are really great. I got a cutting from Fairchild. These are the t another type of melastome, right? Yeah, this is Monolina primula flora. Oh, right. Um, and it does, it is kind of, um, it's got like a codex which I don't know if you can see down yeah, there. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, and we'll kind of kind of go through a dormancy period. We'll drop a lot of leaves and send out some flowers. It's a really neat plant. Should we go through here or around or? Uh, you... Let's stay on this side. I just okay. want to point out our, our chocolate tree too. This is oh, kind of yeah. a must have for any sort of indoor conservatory garden. I can see like just some of the yeah, flowers. Yeah, we've been working are... really hard to do yeah. some hand pollination and we haven't been very successful, but we've added a couple more into the space hoping that Maybe some cross pollination will uh, will do the trick. Yeah. They 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 fruit really well in our greenhouse, but we have multiples kind of next to each other that all bloom at the same time. This is where your beneficials come in. Oh yeah, yeah. In. This is so one of our staff members, Carissa. She uh, she came up with this really innovative way of making these burlap bags. Um, one of the things that the beneficials they come in a carrier material. A lot of time it's bran or yeah. like buckwheat husk. Yeah. And pouring that out on the leaves and stuff, is it's kind of hard, especially in this environment. Like once it gets wet, it like glues onto the leaves and it's like really hard to get off. So we have these little bags and we put that in there so that the bugs can kind of crawl out between the cracks. That's a really great yeah. idea. Because I've also struggled with that when I like release them in my home. And yeah, I'm... I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this fra Peperomia, fra is this Peperomia Frasier on? Yeah. Or is this another type of? 
Because there are some is. peperomia that have like flower, but I've never seen a flower structure this large. Yeah, I know. And this is like this is like a larger variety of the typical yeah. Fraserae. I mean, the leaves get pretty pretty large on this one. You know, I wonder if this really is still Fraserae though, because there are other species that have that type of like. Yeah, flower. and it, it may not be anymore. You yeah. know, again, a lot of these things we got years ago, and they come in with the name, and they may have changed at this point. This one's beautiful, this fern. Bacinium, it's a uh, native to South America. Uh, we got this one from Equigenera. Uh, we were lucky enough to go down there to mm -hmm. handpick some plants, and I saw this on the bench, and I just like grabbed it. It, like, looks, like, have this. Well, it looks like one that could withstand a little bit more of high light conditions. Yes, high light, and actually this is kind of, this This is sort of south facing. It's, yeah. it's a little hard to get your bearings in this building, but um, we're actually facing kind of due south here, so this does get a lot of morning light. Look at this begonia. Uh, yeah. Oh my god. It's amazing of begonias. Chunky flowers. Um, is this a passiflora? That is a passiflora, yeah. The, the great thing, you know, the reason we have this one in here is it's not too aggressive, which a lot of passifloras is vines are very aggressive. Uh, they also can be really buggy. This one tends not to be. Mm -hmm. It also shows the uh, butterfly egg mimic mm -hmm. mimicry, which is mm -hmm. really neat. I think that's a fun story for people that, you know, it looks like it has little butterfly eggs already laid Planted on it. On so they want a butterfly flies along and sees that, it'll just pass by because it huh. doesn't want its offspring to have to compete with another. And then another the plant one. doesn't get eaten. Exactly. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Beautiful maiden hair. Yeah. This is a great begonia here. Ooh, which one is this? This is begonia angularis. You can see the stem back here. Oh, I mean, this yeah. gets very large, very, um, it will actually get kind of woody it's over time. And oh yeah, look at it. It's very like Cissus quadrangularis. Yeah, yeah, it has yeah. that that angular stem. Yeah. But even even these are like a little bit more ang angled, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I love the asymmetry of most begonia leaves. Um, it's something kind of unique to the begonia plant family. Most leaves are pretty symmetrical, but I love that asymmetry. This one also looks like very similar to the, um, the yeah, sort of, what is that that's, sort of? That's Caritoplectus, Carito, Carito that's Plectus, Speciosa. Like, okay. So the other one's Caritoplectus cuticuense. And this, yeah, that's, speci that's speciosa. And then this is uh, one of your beautiful orchids here. Yeah, that's here. a pleurothallus. That's pleurothallus cardiothallus. Um, it's kind of always in bloom, which is fun. Mm. Some more pipers. It's another Hoffmania species, which is a little uh, Ooh, less I've never, common. I've never seen this one. Yeah. It feels a little bit more um, robust. It is, yeah. I think this one would actually do a little better in like a house environment. Yeah. I think I, it could handle the lower humidity better. This one looks like it has a little canopy too to yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's a low grower. It uh, grows pretty fast. It does well from propagation. Oh, and it has, um, the stems kind of have this little ridges yep. on it. Yeah, kind of oh, yeah. like the other ones too. They have yeah. kind of ridge stems. Yeah, you don't know what the species is that. Um, that? I don't, but I will get that okay. to you. Okay, it's great. This peperomia is like. Yeah. I want to bow down to it. Yeah, this pepper, <laughs> peperonia. Uh, peperonia. I always say that on. <laughs> peperomia rugosum has these great underside red leaves. Mm. Um, it's a great grower. It likes to cascade over the rocks here. It's got some mealy bugs, and I was like, oh, look yeah, at that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. But you know, but look, it's it's growing yeah. extremely well. And you know, what we do is like, we have a, you know, we have a staff and we come through and, yeah. we, and we clean these and we, we spend time and we try to hit everything at least once a week and go through and hand remove as much as we can. Oh, this is great, Blakia. I didn't think we would get this, but um, this, this Blakia one? here, yeah. This, one. this is a, it only blooms for about a day. It's wow. another millstone. Oh, but look at how, yeah. how it's coming out right it's here. It's Blakia literalis. Looks like a little pinwheel. Yeah, that's a kind of a recent addition for us um, in the space. I added it about two months ago um, and immediately started going into bud. You know, one of the things that um, people think of as plants is they're very delicate, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of times to get things to flower and do what they do in nature, they need a little bit of stress, whether that's environmental or just like physically taking a plant from one spot to the other. Right, or you know, getting it, giving it a dry period. Giving it a dry or, period. Yeah. Giving these things, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that uh, I don't think is, um, uh, people think of mm -hmm. like when they're growing their plants, they just want to keep them in the same conditions mm -hmm. all the time. But if, you know, that's not what happens in nature. Right, you know? and they, they're like, oh my gosh, I have to yeah. procreate. Yeah, so exactly. Let me, 
<clears throat> this one I saw at the Cloud Forest in Singapore. It's yes. A, it's a like, like the thick cabbage leaves. Yeah, so there's some debate on the genus of this. Mm -hmm. um, we received it as a Piscia corrugata, mm -hmm. um, but it might actually be in the Nautiocalyx family. Mm. Um, although the flowers are very Episcia-like, okay. so um, yeah, they didn't have um, a formal ID on it yeah. when I was in Singapore. Yeah, this one looks really interesting in the back. I just want to point it out because I really love when they have this like natural kind of variegation. I've never yeah. seen anything that's, um, like that's this. Um, that's Justicia. Oh, this is um, a Justicia. It's in, yeah, it's in the um, Acanth family. Um, I never. It's just Cecia extensa. Okay. Yeah, I've never. Um, I'm never good at acanthaceae. Ac I'm. <laughs> I never pick them out. I can never pick them out in a lineup. Yeah. <laughs> Got some orchids through here. Uh, this again is like a higher light area. This we're really trying to baby right here. This is a wow. Anthurium marmoratum. Um, the, the leaf looks leaf really great in. right now. And one of the things with these guys is, uh, you know, they don't put out too many leaves and one little bug chewing on one spot as that expands can cause a tear like you see here. It's really, it's really, really hard. And in the wild, they, they very rarely have leaves that aren't damaged. So trying to get these to come out and look really nice is, is a challenge for us. Do you have slugs in here? We do have slugs. No, slugs yep. and snails? We do have slugs. No, not too many snails. Uh, we have little gray slugs. They're very common in a lot of greenhouses and nurseries. Um, and we, we trap for those. So we have we put out beer traps once a week. Yeah. And, um, that's kind of what we do. And as we find them, we just pick them off. Uh, we actually have slug parties occasionally. We're coming at <laughs> night with headlamps. and. Uh, you know, the person that catches the most slugs wins. Very fraternity thing. oriented. Yeah, you, yeah. Know? you just like put the beer out, you catch them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, look at these. Yeah, this is a uh, Anguloa. Oh my God, it smells uh, like. It's the tulip orchid. It smells like candy. Yeah, <laughs> and what's really interesting about these guys is um, in South America, there's a, about 700 species of orchids that are all pollinated by the orchid bee, the euglossine bee. Uh, it's a great sort of symbiotic relationship where the male euglossine bees go to these flowers because of the fragrance. Mm -hmm. That's why they have these really interesting fragrances. Uh, they don't go to collect pollen, but they go to cl actually collect the scent. Hmm. Uh, they're related to bumblebees, so oh, they yeah, store the, the scent on yeah. their legs, and they to get, visit track a lot of the ladies. They track right? the ladies. Yeah. The best cologne they, wins. They, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They make their own cologne. Which yeah, is so, yeah. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, that's great. Oh, and this is a beautiful peperomia. I yeah. Just want to point this one out because it looks a little different from like typical peperomia leaves. And that one's a very much an epiphytic peperomia. In fact, you can see um, some on oh, our yeah. uh, faux stump back there growing epiphytically. Well, a lot of peperomia, I think of them growing in like the crags of rocks yeah, or like yeah. in the crags of, uh, of wood. Selaginella is, you know, kind of filling in the gaps yep. here. Yeah, this is our Aristolochia arborea. I don't know if it's got any flowers on it. Wow, but, um, I would have never guessed that this would have been an Aristolochia. You know, just that alone, this yeah. woody, shrubby, shrubby plant. There's some buds up there, but none are open. They but have this really unique um, look to them. That's the wonderful part about it is like you, you know, you see the foliage, you think of one thing until you see the flower, you yeah. begin to think of another. Exactly. It's a great little blueberry with species the orange, blooming. With yeah. the orange blooms in a lot the of the tropical blueberries have these tubular flowers and these bright colors because they're mostly pollinated by hummingbirds. And is that still a ceratostemma or is it different? That's not a ceratostemma. I believe that is, I think it's Samicia, but um, mm. I'm not sure. There's quite a few genus of tropical blueberries. What's this um, tree right here that's growing oh, up? Oh, yeah, this is a Mathistica dendron. It's a high elevation relative of Brugmansia, which is angel's trumpet. Wow, so it's solanacea. Solanace yeah, solanaceous. Um, it has those typical kind of white pendulous um, trumpet flowers, huh. but the, the tips of the petals are much longer. It looks, looks like little wings, and they're very, very white. They kind of look like little angels flying. Well, whenever it. I think of Solanaceae's family, I think of like, oh, mealybug heaven. <laughs> yeah, and what's funny about that one is it's actually been pretty clean bug-wise for yeah, us. That's, which that's is, positive. These yeah. are the things that you find out. I know. Some more Fraseri and bloom. Yep. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Just a happy, happy, happy or stressed, who knows, either one. Well, you know, <laughs> they've been in here for a while. On. We've been open for a little over a year and a half, and some of these plants have been in here for about two years. Um, and so they're, you know, this is kind of their natural thing. They've been doing great that we're going into, you know, different season, the light levels are changing. And so there's, you see a lot of things doing stuff now that um, is just a signal of the change of the light. 
I'm so jealous of this caladium. Yeah, this caladium is a fantastic caladium. I believe we got this one from Atlanta Botanical Garden. This is a uh, caladium, it actually doesn't go dormant like most caladiums do. Yeah. I'm gonna butcher the species yeah. on it, but it's caladium, I believe it's palacioanium. <laughs> I, you know, some of these it's names. Tongue, it's a total Some of these names twister. are like, I'm sure you can spell it out yeah. for people, but. Well, I, I, I'm jealous of this because when we think of caladiums, especially indoors, you think of the really papery kind mm -hmm. that go through dormancy and are just like a little, yeah. Um, you know, but this one is like got a thick rubbery leaf. Mm -hmm. I think this would be a really good one. Super indoors. easy to divide. It does pretty well in low light and it actually blooms. It gets these nice white flowers on it too. Love so it. we use a lot of understory palms as well, like their Camaderia metallicums. These are common ones that people could get in their homes too. Yeah, they I've do. I've actually never grown one indoors, but I, I'm, I think I should probably try one because yeah they'll yeah. do well inside for sure yeah and your your cane begonias your angel wings are yeah or is this dragon wing or angel wing i'm not yeah, sure what um, kind of species these are they that's begonia maculata um it's a brazilian species and it's actually like that's how you'd find it in the wild yeah which is really really great some calathea mosaicas mm -hmm. again just the highlighting the diversity in that group i mean everyone's like doesn't look like it's related to the other. Yeah, that Diffenbachia is beautiful too. Yeah, that's a unknown species of Diffenbachia there. So should we make our way up to the second yes, floor? Yes, I think we should go check out the second floor now. What were some of the most eye-catching plants on the first floor of the spheres? Share your pics in the comments section below. If you're digging these videos and the channel, then I'd love for you to subscribe and hit the notifications button. It not only helps support the channel, but also ensures you see when new videos drop. And if you'd like to learn more of the nuts and bolts of houseplant care, then check out the Houseplant Masterclass, the first audiovisual online course of houseplant care, cultivation, maintenance, and more at houseplantmasterclass.com.